they used to work with uh, Aslandi and others uh, uh, working uh, on transplanting. And I remember uh, it, it was uh, a mini Woodstock moment, actually, for, uh, for crystallography, because our big challenge is to tackle this space problem. And uh, Lucas uh, and others, but particularly Lucas's uh, contribution uh, over the past few years has been you know, central uh, to exploring, to exploring uh, and exploiting the possibilities. So it's with great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce Lucas now and uh, looking forward to your talk. Lucas. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the kind introduction. <coughs> well, I'm by far not as amusing as the previous speakers, so I hope you will not fall asleep in this uh, little light. Yeah, uh, Structure Solution Sunday, I like this name. So this will be, what I will talk about is actually the already a fourth Structure Solution Method for this thing, Structure Solution Method after classical direct methods, after the new exciting VLG algorithm, the maximum entropy, we come to the charge flipping method, and I have good starting point because you know already essentially everything about the phase problem, what are we trying to solve, what is the problem, and so I can more or less concentrate on the method itself. Nevertheless, I will say a few words just for repetition. So what, are, what we are trying to solve with structure solution is we try to find the structure from diffraction data. So we have diffraction amplitudes and we want to know at the end the positions of the atoms. But what we probe with the, the diffraction methods is the scattering density. That's electron density if we use X-rays, that's electrostatic potential if we use electrons, it's uh, neutron scattering density if we use neutrons. But uh, that's the information, that's, that's the physical quantity we probe. And then the structure that's our interpretation. So we know that there are atoms at the peaks of the electron density, so we place them there. But the physical quantity we probe and we try to recover is uh, the scattering density. So charge flipping is a method for ab initio determination of an approximate scattering density from a set of structure factor amplitudes. I emphasize the approximate scattering density because this is really the output. Uh, the interpretation is the next step, and often it turns out to be more difficult to correctly interpret, automatically correctly interpret, scattering density than to find the scattering density itself. So it's often useful to check the, the, the primary results, the scattering density, and not to trust the automatic interpretation. I will repeat it maybe more than once in the course of my talk. Charge flipping uh, was published in 2004 and it was actually picked up quite, quite quickly by a couple of people including me and generalized applied to uh, many things. The nice thing about it is that it is very general and it uses very little approximation, uh, very little um, yeah, approximations and prior information. So it, requires actually only lattice parameters and uh, reflection intensities. It doesn't use explicitly symmetry information. It doesn't use at all the chemical information. It is, of course, it does, didn't just fall from heaven. It's related from, to many other methods. It started in the image reconstruction field with the gagnon saxton Gagnac saxton algorithm the hybrid input-output FINAPS algorithm, and then there are even crystallography methods that are related, uh, low density elimination, Elzer's difference map, and actually also the average alternating reflections. That would make a separate talk if I was about to tell you what is the history, what are the relationships, so forgive me if I just skip the historical um, uh, links and relations and concentrate on the, on the logic behind the method. There are many ways to approach uh, the method, to approach the explanation of how it works, but probably the, the best, most logical and most elucidating is the approach of um, project, projections onto constraints. So what we have, we can reformulate our 
our structure solution problem as looking for a density that fulfills several constraints that we impose. Typical constraint, classical constraint on an electron density, if we speak about electron density, is that it's everywhere positive. So we can, we can refuse all the densities that have negative parts. And then we have our experimental constraint. So we search for, uh, for uh, density that, after Fourier transforming, gives us structure factors with correct amplitudes. We don't know the phases, but we know the amplitude. So only those densities that, are, that give us correct structure factor moduli are acceptable. So we have these two constraints, you could formulate our other constraints, but let's say we have these two constraints and we look in the space of all possible electron densities and we are trying to find one or several densities that fit these two constraints. And we can very schematically draw this in two dimensions. So imagine that your search space, space of all possible densities, is this plane. In reality, the search space has many hundred or can have hundred thousand dimensions because it has, uh, it has as many dimensions as there are pixels in your electron density map. So it's typically in the order of uh, hundred thousand. So we have 100,000 dimensional space, but we approximate or schematically represent this space with two dimensions in the plane. And then you have constraints. So you can say that this ellipse represents all densities that match the Fourier uh, amplitude constraint. Again, this is just a scheme. I don't say that in reality the constraint would look like that. And this might be, again, a representation of all densities that are positive. And you see that there is a non-zero intersection between them. In two dimensions, it's totally trivial to find the intersection. But imagine you are in 10,000 dimensions and you want to find an algorithm that will find the intersection. It's not quite that easy, but mathematicians are clever people and they found that the problem has always solution if the two sets, these two subsets of the space are convex. Okay, in simple words, you have no lobes, you have no curves, it's straight line or an ellipse or circle, some, something that's without any um, yeah, okay, lobes curves. Um, in that case, there are several algorithms that you can use, but there is a very simple algorithm. You start from a random starting point. Again, we heard that random starting points are very useful. Um, so you start from random starting point and you make an orthogonal projection on one of the two constraints. So I find the nearest point on the constraint C1 and move there. That's my first step. Then I find the nearest point on the constraint C2 and I repeat the procedure. So I do alternating projections on the constraint sets you see that after a couple of steps, I come arbitrarily close to the solution. So this works always for convex constraint sets. Unfortunately, in crystallography, uh, we don't have convex constraint sets, especially the amplitude constraints. So the constraint on the structure factor module, module is hopelessly non-convex. So we have something that resembles this situation. We could ask ourselves, would the first algorithm work in this case? So let's try. We start from a random point, we project on one of the constraints. Um, I rename that, them CA for amplitude constraint and CP for positive constraint. But it's still a scheme, it doesn't mean that the two constraints have, constraints have this form. So I project, I project on the other constraint. Once more, and after four steps, I found the solution, the intersection. That's excellent. So let's, let's make another attempt. We start from over there, random point, we project, another projection, yet one more, and you see that we got stuck. We got stuck in the distance minimum, sorry, we got stuck in the distance minimum between the two constraints. 
constraint sets. So that's the problem with non-convex constraints that we cannot use the simple algorithms that are prone to work with convex constraint sets. We can still try to use them, but there is no guarantee that it will work. There is, however, a simple remedy to this problem, and this is the use of so-called overprojections or reflectors. So instead of projecting from the point onto the constraint set, we continue in the same way further. So instead of moving here, we move here. So we overdo the shift from our random starting point onto the point of the constraint. So let's see what happens. So we moved here, and now we find the nearest point on the, on the second constraint, and we continue in that direction further on. And now, again, it's the red one, so we move here, and you see we got again attracted to this point, but because of the overprojection, we escape from the minimum. And the next projection goes again onto the red line, and it is already here. And you see that we get attracted like a moth to a light, we get attracted to the correct solution. So if the solution is correct, if there is a real intersection, the overprojections are okay and they don't escape from the solution. But if you have a, a, a false minimum like this, then the overprojections allow you to escape. And now, Why do we stop the overprojections? Sorry? Why do we stop the overprojections? That is a parameter that you can choose, but a very useful and very simple parameterless choice is to do twice the distance from the point to the constraint set. So the distance that you make to here, you repeat it once more. That's the so-called reflector. So, and now you can start building up more complicated schemes. For example, you can do the projection or over projection, another over projection, and then take an average between this point and the starting point. This is a so-called alternating average reflection scheme. And you can actually continue ad infinitum. There are many ways you can combine projections, over projections, and so on. And each method that I mentioned is actually a different combination of these, uh, these steps. So charge flipping in its original form was actually a combination of an over projection on one constraint, on the positivity constraint, that's the flipping operation, and simple projection on the amplitude constraint, but uh, since then other schemes were tried and what remains the, <coughs> the essence of the charge flipping operation is, uh, sorry, of the charge flipping algorithm is the charge flipping operation which is actually in the heart is the definition of the projection that we use or uh, you could put it also differently that's the definition of the constraint that we use. I will come to that Next slide. So in the previous slide I explained somehow the idea behind the solution using uh, dual space methods, so in general dual space methods. The charge flipping then in its original variant is this simple flowchart. It's really nothing more in there than this flowchart. Uh, yeah, by the way this flowchart was produced by Lynn McCusker. I myself produced quite a few of them but I like this most. So, uh, we start from known structure factor amplitudes, that's our data, and we combine them with random phases. And we get sort of a random starting point. It's not completely random because we have the amplitudes, but sort of random starting point. We get, by Fourier transform, we get a trial electron density map, which is wrong because we use wrong phases. And then the flipping operation comes. So everything, every small density, smaller than certain positive threshold delta, is multiplied by minus one. So if you imagine it geometrically, you are flipping all the density values that are smaller than some positive value delta. And if you look at it from the point of view of the projections and over projection, this is an over projection. It's essentially an over projection of the positivity constraint. So the 
positivity constraint would be setting everything what is negative to zero. The charge mapping is, I'd say, sort of a radical overprojection to this projection. So that's the flipping operation. And we get a new perturbed electron density map. We make another Fourier transform, get back to the Fourier space. We have new amplitudes, new phases, but we know the amplitudes, so we can replace the new amplitudes with the data, with the real amplitudes that we know from the experiment, and we return by Fourier transform to a new electron density map. So this step here, that's the projection onto the amplitude constraints. So in very simple terms, in direct space we make the flipping operation, in reciprocal space we restore the experimental amplitudes. And we repeat this circle uh, until convergence or until the prescribed number of uh, cycles. This is what it looks like in reality. So each frame here is one electron density after one cycle of iteration. I must make a high resolution version of this. Quote. Do you see? It seems that nothing is happening. And suddenly, at one moment, you get a solution. In five cycles or less, uh, I read once more. So, at this, moment, at this moment, the method probes the phase space. It seems that nothing is happening, really. It takes some moment, nothing is happening, but there is something happening. Uh, behind the scenes, and then suddenly, when the search comes close enough to the solution, it converges just like uh, if you throw uh, a stone in a valley, it will just go down. <coughs> so, that's the method, that's the principle, that's how it works, and now what is it good for? Well, the advantage of the method is uh, that it really uses uh, minimum assumptions and uh, minimum approximations. It doesn't use uh, atoms, so there are no atoms placed in the unit cell during the calculation. It really works only on the density. That's a property that's uh, shared uh, with the new BLT algorithm, at least as far as I remember, uh, as I understand it. Uh, there is no explicit use of space group symmetry. I will talk about it later. You can use it for X-ray data, neutron data, electron diffraction data. It actually doesn't care about the type of radiation you use to get the diffraction data. It can be easily generalized to incommensurate structures. Maybe you know that incommensurate structures are described in higher dimensional space. So the method can be easily uh, generalized to four, five, six dimensions, and it really works also for incommensurate data. The disadvantage, if I may call it like that, is that it requires atomic resolution. That's actually shared uh, or common to most of uh, ab initio structure solution methods. Uh, but, uh, so, the limit is there is no hard limit. But more or less, if you have light atoms and resolution worse than 1.3 in D min, then it's, it will be hard to solve it by charge limit. For heavier atoms, uh, the limits are much more relaxed. Probably the main limitation is that it requires reasonably complete data. Again, what is reasonably? Sometimes 80% is not enough, sometimes 50% is just fine. So, it depends on the structure, it depends on the sort of missing data, but uh, the general rule is as complete as possible. And because it's a Fourier method, so it, it's making Fourier transforms, it requires the presence of the strongest reflections, even if the, the, the intensities are just, or the moduli are just approximate, it's better than not having them at all. So, if you have saturated reflections, it's a bad idea to throw them away, that's what the diffractometer programs often do. It's a good idea to include them for the structure solution step and not use them just for, don't use them later for the refinement. Well, the symmetry. <coughs> well, maybe you know the 
classical Roman saying uh, mater semper certa ad pater incertus, that meaning means that the mother is always certain and father is always uncertain. Uh, in life, it's not true anymore, but uh, we could say that symmetry is a mother in uh, the structure solution process. So, very often we can be essentially 100% sure about the symmetry, but quite often it's not that true. There are statistical means to determine the symmetry from the diffraction data, but there is very often certain degree of ambiguity, sometimes more, sometimes less. Charge flipping does not actively use the symmetry, apart from the symmetry of the input data. So, wow, it was. It solves the structure in P1, and to answer a logical question that you could ask, why do we do that? Why don't we solve or don't we use the space group symmetry information if we know it, if we have it? The reason is that it works better in P1 than if we impose the symmetry. So at the beginning it was a nuisance. We thought it would be good to include the symmetry, but it turned out to be an advantage because you don't have to know the symmetry. And if you are wrong about the symmetry, you can still solve the structure and the program can tell you, I think this is the correct symmetry because it can look at the solution with, and if the solution is correct, the symmetry is in there. So you can look at the solution and de determine the symmetry from the solution. And there you have more information, not just the amplitudes, as in the fraction pattern, but also the phases that are included in the density. So, we can determine the space group after the structure solution. So, the classical, the standard uh, scheme for solving structures is, we measure the data, we determine the symmetry from the data, we use also the composition, and these three bits of information join together in the structure solution process. Now, if you are wrong about symmetry, or if there is something wrong with the composition, I must say something fundamentally wrong, if you are just a bit off, it's usually not a problem. But if you believe you have uranium in your, in your structure, and you have just carbon, you, will have, you might have troubles with uh, some metals. So, then it's not, uh, you get a problem. However, with the charge flipping approach or philosophy, I may call it like that, you get data, you solve the structure without any information about the composition, you determine the symmetry from the structure solution, and then you continue to the interpretation, and of course then you need some information about the composition, but you can cross-check the composition with the solution. So, since, uh, since the publication of the charge flipping method, there, there have been a couple of programs that implement the method. Um, it's Platon, that you most probably know, which has its flipper routine. It's Topaz, which has its own charge flipping routine, uh, combined with some elements of direct methods. Um, it's Olex2, which has this SMTDX uh, routine. Um, I hope I didn't forget anything. If I did, I apologize. Uh, and then there is a program that I developed since uh, about 2006. It's called Superflip, and the name comes from charge flipping in superspace because one of the specialties of the program is that it works also in superspace in higher dimension. Um, it has certain number of properties, I want to highlight just a few of them. First, to answer the inevitable question, it's a free program, you can download it from this web page, and it is also distributed together with a couple of uh, programs, and it's interfaced from quite a few other programs. So if you download the other 2006, that's the program that will be used for tutorials. Um, Superflip is included. It's included in VGX, and it's, uh, I hope, I think it's included also in Crystals. You can interface it from Olex, from Mount, and there is an interface from Highscore Plus. So there's actually quite a few programs that can serve as a front end to call Superflip. And as far as I know, this is it's 
the only program that can really determine the space group symmetry from the solution. So, so far, well, I, I'm talking more than I wanted, sorry. So far, uh, the general part about charge tripping, and now I want to say a few words about charge tripping for electron diffraction, and specialties of charge tripping for electron diffraction, and for powder diffraction. So there are, there are special particular um, variants, modifications, and things to consider for the two uh, applications. So, for charge tripping, uh, sorry, for electron diffraction, there is no need to modify the algorithm itself or the program because uh, it doesn't use atomic scattering factors, so you can just use the diffraction data as you get them and, and uh, uh, make a calculation. So, there are essentially two applications of charge tripping. The first one is the reconstruction of two dimensional projections. Similarly to what uh, Chris Gilmore showed in his talk, so just, you take just reflections in one um, zone axis and uh, you reconstruct the projection. It is actually limited to special cases where the projections behave properly. If in the projections you have many atoms at various places, it will not work, as it will not work for most of other methods. So the main application is just classical structure solution of 3D structures from 3D precession electron diffraction data. Here I emphasize that the precession electron diffraction is necessary. You can try without precession. It might work for very light structures, like for organic structures, but for most of the structures from data without precession, you will not get the solution. There are a couple of difficulties with the electron diffraction data. Because of the dynamical effects that are included, even if you use precession, um, the data are essentially very noisy. Uh, they have to be regarded as very noisy uh, diffraction data. So therefore, it's a little bit dif difficult to recognize that the program converged. Um, the solution is not always stable and it's not always perfect. So, the bottom line is you have to make several trials. For X-rays, usually the first trial gives you a solution. For uh, electrons, it's useful to make several trials and uh, look for the best solution. Data completeness is an issue. I said already that it's a Fourier-based method. It, is, uh, it, is, uh, it requires reasonably complete data. And if you have electron diffraction data collected at a set, of oriented zone axis patterns, the data completeness is usually relatively low. Therefore, I'm a big fan of the diffraction tomography method. Uh, those of you from the electron part have heard about the diffraction tomography from Tekol and from Tatiana Gorelli. Um, Peter Oleinikov, I think, will have this talk later, I hope. Uh, so, that will be another talk in, in the same direction. So it's a method that's actually classical or normal for X-rays. You just collect a series of images uh, by tilting the crystal by one degree or a certain amount of tilt. And what you get is something like this. This is a reconstruction of reciprocal space from such a tilt series. Um, you see, you see the wedge, because usually we cannot, never, we can never tilt plus minus 90 degrees, but we can tilt plus minus 50 or maybe more, and that gives you more than half of the total sphere, and very often this gives you a complete data set if you have reasonable symmetry. So you get a data set that, in the terms of completeness, essentially equivalent to an X-ray data set, and in terms of resolution, it's often superior to. A X-ray data set. So then, if you extract the intensities from such a data set, you can plug it into charge tripping as if it was an X-ray data set. And if you, if there is no other surprise, bad surprise, you get the solution. 
that looks like this. This is a three-dimensional electron density map represented as isosurfaces, and you can see nice round peaks that represents the atom. And then if you interpret the map, of course, there are automatic uh, interpreters, so you don't have to do it by hand. You see that the structure is, is perfectly solved. All atoms are there. This is the structure of special type. It's a magnetic very garment. So the bottom line for electron diffraction is if you have reasonably complete data set, you can solve the structure essentially as if it was a very noisy X-ray data set, but it works. It usually works. Not always, but usually. Uh, for powders, the situation is a little bit different. It's the same in the sense that uh, you can consider powder diffraction data as very, no as very noisy X-ray uh, single diffraction data, so single crystal diffraction data. But the type of noise is different. Of course, I know I'm repeating the obvious, but I will repeat it. The problem is that you have, you can have severe overlap. You can have overlaps of intensities and you can't separate them. In some cases, even for moderately complicated structure, the, the overlap is not dramatic. At the first glance, this looks like uh, a dense uh, series of peak positions, but if you look at the full width of half maximum, this is uh, an, uh, a synchrotron data set, you would see that there are actually very few reflections that are really overlapping. So if you have such case, excellent data set, and not too, too large structure, you can actually treat such data set as a single crystal data set. So you can extract the intensities and consider them as single crystal intensities. If you have severe overlaps, you need additional tricks. But first, I will say something about the first case. So then you could say, okay, there is nothing to gain. But uh, here, the symmetry determination property of charge flipping or super flip uh, is even more advantageous than for single crystals because in some symmetries, especially in trigonal and hexagonal, the ambiguity in the space group can be quite severe. So in this case, this is a structure which has true symmetries P, 6 bar, 2C, it's a Latin tank state structure. Uh, we are actually quite lucky because we have only three possibilities in hexagonal space groups because of the C byte and two other possibilities in trigonal space groups. But without any systematic absences, if you have a hexagonal uh, unit cell, you have, and the experts will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have 15 possible space groups. So it's quite useful to be able to solve the structure without really choosing one of the 15. And it's actually quite useful also to not to have to choose to choose one of the five. So you can run charge flipping without assumption, without a selection of the space group, and superflip will give you at the end will give you an output saying that it derives space group P6 bar to C. This is one of the tutorial examples, so if you wish you can try it can give it a try and you can see how it works in practice. Okay, this is the structure. So, for if you have severe overlaps, you need additional tricks. If you try extract, to extract the data from a severely overlapped uh, diffraction pattern and you try to run charge flipping, you can have two cases. First is, you get absolute rubbish. Then you are lost, and you have to try something else. Probably some global optimization method that we will listen to uh, after this lecture. But often you get something that somehow resembles the solution. You can see that there are layers here, there are peaks that, at the first glance, they make an impression that it could be something, but it's totally un uninterpretable, such a matter. So we need to repartition the overlapping intensity. How can we do it? We need an external information. And the external information is the density histogram. Again, we heard already about density histogram from uh, Chris. He uses it just as a, a 
as a means to select the, the best density. In the powder charge shaping algorithm, we use it to actively modify the density during the calculation. And here you see the reason. This is a density histogram of a random density. Uh, ignore these bars, this is just a screenshot from a program that plots the density, so five minutes. Um, yeah, so ignore the bars. So this is a broad distribution from random density. If you get a poor solution, you get something like that. This is the random background, and then you have some peaks that give you the high flank. And a good solution has again random background and a strong positive flank of of large densities that correspond to the atomic position. So if you have such a poor solution, you can try to modify the density so that the histogram matches this one. So you can stretch and squeeze the peaks to, you know, to get the expected histogram. And of course, if I say stretch and squeeze, there is some mathematics behind it. So and what you get is a modified density that's probably better than the, the one before the modification and if you fully transform that, you get new structure factor amplitudes. And you can repartition the overlapping intensities, so those that you know only the sum of, you can repartition it so that the ratios of the overlapping intensities correspond to the ratios that were calculated from the modified density. So by, by this a bit complicated uh, method, we use the, the, the histogram information actively for repartitioning uh, uh, the density. And this is again the standard charge ripping algorithm, and this is what it looks like for the uh, histogram matching procedure. So every n cycles, where n is can be 100 or so, we make the histogram matching, so we stretch and squeeze the electron density to match the histogram. We make a back, uh, inverse Fourier transform, we get new calculated amplitudes. We repartition the overlapping reflections so that the ratios correspond to these calculated values, but the sum corresponds to the experimental sum, because this is our constraint, we know that. And we return back, uh, we get new set of uh, such effect amplitudes, new electron density, and again we continue a couple of cycles of charge. And this is what uh, the, the layered silicate E401 looks like, this is again before the histogram matching, you've seen this image, and this is after the histogram matching, and you can, well maybe you can't, but uh, the solution is absolutely perfect. If you look from another perspective, it's a sort of, it's a zeolite-like structure, so it has tetrahedra, silicon, oxygen that are connected, and you can see that all atoms are there, uh, everything is nice and perfect, and you can solve the structure, or you can interpret the structure. And again, even here, the structure, the symmetry determination procedure can be used. So again, if you have some ambiguity, it is a bit more subtle. There are many, uh, well, degrees of freedom, so it doesn't work 100%, but it still can give you some indication about the symmetry if you, if you, uh, you miss your spatial determination before the structure solution. And this is another example where this uh, histogram matching charge living variant was quite useful. It's um, a structure of zeolite uh, IM5 with 864 atoms in the unit cell with quite a large degree of overlap. It is so complicated that it couldn't be solved by even by charge living with histogram matching, but it could be solved in combination of uh, electron high resolution, sorry, uh, no, high resolution uh, data from transmission electron microscope and a histogram matching in charge flipping and uh, we will hear about this combination that nicely unifies the two worlds that are present in the room. Uh, we will have a lecture about this by Christian Lebel. So, if you think you have not heard enough about charge flipping, then uh, you will be welcome to follow the demo on Superflip in two days, where I will really demonstrate how the program is used on uh, one example from electron diffraction and one example on powder diffraction. 
If you want to learn even more, just try it yourself. So there are slots uh, allocated for tutorials, and there are again several tutorials for electron diffraction and powder diffraction using YAML 2006 as a graphical interface and as a crystallography background and superflip for solution. If you are still not satisfied, then you are cordially welcome to come to Prague for one of our active workshops. And I hope I won't be accused uh, of uh, a uh, unsolicited uh, advertisement, but uh, okay, I take the risk. Uh, we organize Prague, we organize on demand uh, workshops uh, on Yama 2006, which cover small molecule crystallography in its entirety, essentially. So it includes also structure solution by charge flipping, powders, and also electron uh, diffraction. If you are interested, you have to sign in and say which topics you are interested in. And if there are at least five people interested in the same topic, we organize the workshop. So it's really on demand and it's free. You just pay your uh, travel and accommodation. The last, very last thing, this is the area view of Prague. This is our institute, and this is the Prague Castle. So there is an added value in coming to our institute. <laughs> Don't tell your boss when you try to get uh, funding for a trip, but it's not, not that bad as a location. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, talk and uh, some fantastic advertising at the end. Uh, we have time for uh, several questions, and can I remind people uh, when you uh, when you're asking the question, could you say where you are, uh, from who you are, and where you're from, please? Uh, so, any questions? Okay. Paul. Hi, Paul Swan from the University of Sheffield. Um, my question is regarding powder diffraction. Um, do you still have the requirement for high resolution data? With the enhanced charge with the with the Um Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it depends. If you have heavy atoms, uh, 1.3 is not the limit. Um, so it, it's more relaxed. But it really, very much depends on the structure of the composition, on the details. But three, the three atoms is not enough. <laughs> Um, anybody else uh, at the back there, please? So, I'm Andre Lope. I have one question. Uh, for your calculation, you have to put a threshold of flipping. How do you select this data? Sorry, I can't hear you. Could you uh, uh, approach the microphone? Okay. For your calculation, you have to put threshold of flipping. How do you estimate this threshold? Uh, the threshold? Oh, yes. Um, that actually it turns out that it's uh, quite closely related to the variance of the electron um, of the density. So you can calculate it. Uh, nowadays, it's actually not a problem. For um, normal structures, there is a value that is that is known to work. It's about one sigma. So if you calculate the variance of your uh, of your electron density, uh, which is actually essentially constant during the calculation then this variance, the square root of that, is your threshold. So, it's not an issue. Uh, it, it's a parameter that was found experimentally to be around 1 sigma of the density. Alex Oyen, Rick Echo, Berlin, Germany. Uh, in similar approach used in the inversion of X-ray reflectivity, it's uh, all the flipping of the zeros of reflectivity in the first place. And there is a problem not only under sampling of data, but also over sampling of data. And therefore, Nike theorem is strongly advised for using this method. Do you have something similar in your flipping charge approach of the data over sampling? In case of reflectivity, it just breaks the confounded of the I don't know if it's my ears or the acoustic, but I, I really got just half of your question. I'm really sorry. Uh, sorry. You are asked about the, if we have problem of oversampling the data. Yeah. yeah. In what terms? Uh, in terms of the functions of the method. 
Well, um, so you want to say that in, uh, in the reflectivity, uh, if you have too many data, it's, it gives convergent problems. Yeah. That's what you said. Yeah, exactly. No, it's not a problem here. The more, the, the more data you have, the better. With the greatest of some respects, I say I'm looking for people who are, uh, who are young and, uh, and uh, eager. Not that you're older than you. Yeah, I'm just really against that. I'd love to ask some questions myself, but I'm going to. Right, yes, please. Lucia, my name from Hungary. Uh, Hello, Lucia. Uh, Lucia, I'm going to ask you a question. When you talk about complete data for a single crystal, do you mean that means that you need a complete EVA sphere to use Superflip, or can you have like all support? Uh, when I say that we don't use symmetry, I said apart from the symmetry of the input intensities. So the lower class is usually ambiguous. So you know what is your lower class, so you can use it uh, to average the data and expand the data in full sphere. So it's enough to have independent uh, data set in terms of lower class. Uh, Henry, did you have a question? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this histogram and matching and modification, how do you do it in practice, really? Is it the implementation of this software? Um, well, I think that's a question we should discuss uh, later, because it's really it, it's technical. Essentially, you take the histogram of the, of the density, you take the correct histogram, you slice it into small parts, and then you you, you linearly interpolate the uh, values in your density to match the expected values in the histogram. So you really stretch the histogram that you have to get the correct histogram, or squeeze, or whatever, whatever you want. But it's, uh, and I can tell you what for, I can give you four plus if you wish. And perhaps uh, one last question then, uh, to, if, is, make it, can you make it quick, please? <laughs> Well, my name is Matthew Kande, I'm a uh, Actually, I have maybe a question. <laughs> I have uh, uh, organic samples and I have overlap peaks. So, do you recommend to use the software flip uh, software? Um, I will make the answer uh, quick yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't guarantee that it will work, but if other work, things don't work, well, we try. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good question and quick answer. Uh, yes. Another yes or no question. In the uh, electron diffraction reconstruction from a tomographic series, you say that um, because of the analytical diffraction effect, you cannot trust the intensity of the spot, so you treat as a noisy data set. But once you have a solution, a tentative solution, do you not use a drop wave approach to calculate this effect and compare it with uh, the data and see if they match? Again, a simple answer yes, <laughs> but uh, it requires some programming. Of doing that, and not, it's, it's a bit more complicated than many of If you don't want to wait half a month for the result, it's a bit difficult. Okay, I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day there, and thank you again, Luis, for a very clear presentation.